Hello and welcome to ITV News Meridian. Tonight's headlines in the southeast. Buckling under the strain of COVID sickness. Trains and hospitals report record amounts of staff absence. And one viewer tells us how her sister's operation had to be cancelled multiple times. You get to that high, everybody's sort of saying good luck and everything, and then you come crashing down again because then it's like, no, it hasn't happened. New hope for the family who've waited so many years for answers about the death of their daughter in Sussex in the 1980s. Also this Tuesday evening, with one in seven of us struggling to get a good night's sleep, with tips on how to crack the bedtime routine and help our mental health. Good evening. The new year started with an unprecedented number of daily COVID infections, more than 218,000. And that's affecting public transport, hospitals, workplaces, just about every aspect of public life. The Prime Minister said the NHS is now on a war footing. Well, some health trusts across the country have now declared critical incidents. It's feared more could follow in the coming days. And the human cost of this disruption was made clear when one woman from Sussex told us of the stress and psychological impact such delays have had on her family. Well, in a moment, the latest on the overall picture. But first this from Charlotte Wilkins in Worthing. January is often the busiest time of year for the NHS, but with staff shortages caused by COVID and rising Omicron cases, the pressure on our hospitals is mounting. We know that staff are working incredibly hard, be that nurses, doctors, allied health professionals, ambulance services, to give their very, very best. But of course, you know, they are very frustrated um, and really concerned about the level of care that they're able to give because of the shortages of, of staff and the pressure, I think, um, on the National Health Service. And it's that pressure which has led to diagnosis delays and cancelled operations. Trudy Tandy's sister has been waiting to have a brain tumour removed at the Royal Sussex County Hospital in Brighton. The operation has been cancelled five times in the last few weeks. We, we've just sat and watched her disappear before our eyes. Um, we've, we've all been at our wits end for months now, not just the past couple of weeks, but months. And yes, it's, 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 it's a massive strain. First, it was because the surgeon had COVID. Later, they were told there were no intensive care beds available. She has now gone in for the operation today, but has once again been told there are no ICU beds that are free. So the family have no idea if the operation will actually go ahead. With the impact of Christmas get-togethers yet to become clear, work continues on the creation of a Nightingale Hospital in Ashford to deal with a surge in Omicron cases. However, the big concern is, will they have enough people to staff it? With a number of NHS trusts now declaring critical incidents, we watch and wait to see if any in our region follow suit. Charlotte Wilkins, ITV News. So, will the government be forced to bring in new restrictions? Live to our political correspondent, Phil Hornby. Phil, you've been listening to the Prime Minister who's just held a news conference in Downing Street. What did he say? Well, Andrew, it's pretty clear we're entering a new stage of this crisis and the governor particularly worried about absenteeism, not just in the NHS that we've just been hearing about, but in all sorts of workplaces. So from now, 100,000 key workers from food pressing, processing workers to uh, border force workers will be given daily lateral flow tests to try and keep them at work. And in the NHS, there'll be more help from volunteers and in some places from the military too. And all that means, said the Prime Minister, that at the moment, more restrictions are not needed. As our NHS moves to a war footing, I will be recommending to Cabinet tomorrow that we continue with Plan B because the public have responded and changed their behaviour, changed your behaviour, buying valuable time to get boosters in arms and help the NHS to cope with the Omicron wave. It does seem, Phil, Omicron often causes milder disease than Delta. 
Yeah, that's true. That's what the evidence from South Africa and indeed from this country now is showing. But, and this is a rather big but. This has largely been an infection amongst younger people up until now. And it's moving up the age range now. And as it moves up the age range, you would expect to see more hospitalizations. And we don't know for sure how that's going to manifest and what degree of disease. Still lots of unknowns and uh, COVID, as we know, usually has a few nasty surprises up its sleeve for us. But the main news from Downing Street tonight is no new restrictions at the moment. Thank you for that. Thanks very much, Phil Hornby. Well, the impact of the pandemic is being felt on rail services in Kent and Sussex, with staff shortages seeing cancellations and delays. Worst affected is Southern, the company making what it calls a difficult decision by cancelling all trains to London, Victoria and redirecting them to London Bridge until next Monday at the earliest. With more, here's James Dunham. It was more hush hour than rush hour on this Southern train. Passengers staying away. Perhaps they got the message about the disruption. I work in an industry where we're suffering similar sort of staffing shortages. Paul's sympathetic as to why, but it won't make his journey any quicker. So I'm heading to Clapham Junction today um, from, uh, from Brighton area. Uh, and yeah, I've got to change. Normally I'd be able to head directly to Clapham Junction. I'm changing to uh, East Croydon today. I've uh, got to uh, leave East Croydon Station, get a tram out to Wimbledon and changing everything and uh, going to Clapham Junction. It sounds long. Uh, yes, so it's probably adding an extra 30 minutes, maybe too much early. Southern services from the southeast to London, Victoria are suspended then until next Monday. Trains will instead be redirected and terminate at London Bridge. And three weeks after being reintroduced, the Gatswick Express is again cancelled. Southern trains to Victoria weren't running over Christmas because of engineering works, but for them not to return after the festive period would have been unthinkable just a few years ago. It is, though, a reflection of Covid's serious impact on the rail industry, with one in ten staff off sick. On Thameslink, there is a reduced service too. The Raynham to London line will only go as far as Dartford, while Southeastern's warning of cancellations as it prepares to cut 7% of its trains from next Monday because staff are isolating. I think we're bound to see more delays and more cancellations. And so train companies have got to keep very focused on getting good quality information to passengers as quickly as possible, having staff around at big stations who can help out, offer assurance, and being flexible, let people travel when they can, forget the ticket restrictions, just get people home, get them to college or whatever. Southern say tickets can be accepted on other routes. Living with the virus looked like this at London Victoria today, supposed to be one of the UK's busiest rail stations. Well, let's speak to James, who's live at Haywards Heath for us tonight. So, James, we're expecting Victoria services to resume on Monday, then? We are, Amanda. Southern will release an update on its timetable for next week in the coming days. But I think even if Victoria services do resume, they will be reduced. Train companies like Southern and Southeastern are amending their timetables to avoid last-minute cancellations and to try and give passengers more certainty. And it's not just trains that are affected, is it, James? Indeed, anyone waiting for a stagecoach bus today in Canterbury, Hastings, Ashford, Dover and Folkestone might have been doing so for a little longer than normal because services were also cancelled. Away from the transport sector, we know that food deliveries and the postal service are also struggling to cope with reduced staffing numbers. But here tonight, for anyone planning to use a train from this station or indeed any from Kent and Sussex, Amanda, are being told to do exactly the same thing. Check before heading out to make sure the journey is still running. Yeah, very good advice there, James. Thank you very much indeed. And of course, we can bring you more on any effects of the pandemic on the region, including the trains as well, any more cancellations. We'll let you know on our website, together with today's top stories in the region. Just go to itv.com forward slash Meridian. Murder squad detectives have arrested two people in connection with the death of a man in Folkestone. Police were called to a report of an assault at an address on Coolidge Lane on Sunday. A man in his 60s was taken to hospital but later died. A 31-year-old man and a 36-year-old woman have been arrested. An inquest has opened and adjourned into the deaths of two new mothers at two different Kent hospitals. 
Kim Sampson and Samantha McCaughey both died with herpes infections shortly after giving birth. They both had a caesarean and were both operated on by the same surgeon. A new £2 coin to celebrate the life and legacy of Dame Vera Lynn goes on sale today. The coin features a portrait of the singer who lived in Ditchling near Brighton as she appeared during the height of her fame. A new inquest into the murder of an art student more than 30 years ago in Eastbourne has renewed hope her killer could finally be found. Jessie Earle's body was discovered near Beachy Head in 1989 nine years after she disappeared from her bedsit. The High Court has ruled there should be a new hearing after the original one returned an inconclusive verdict, despite the fact she was found tied up and naked. Well, serial killer Peter Tobin could be called to give evidence, and her parents, John and Val, want to see bedsit murderer David Fuller investigated too. With more on that, here's James Co Joe Caution. Jessie Earle vanished from her bedsit in Eastbourne in May 1980. Sussex police weren't treating it as suspicious. When her body was found in 1989, her bra was tied around her wrists and she had been stripped naked. Yet senior officers were quick to rule out murder and the inquest came back with an open verdict. After fierce campaigning from her parents, the High Court have ordered a new inquest describing it as a compelling case for a finding of unlawful killing. Couldn't be more delighted. Could it's, we? It's, no, that's right. <laughs> it's, it's very, very strange, though, to get a decision 30-odd years after you've wanted it. And it's just... And it's also the fact that it's happened when you've been told quite positively that it couldn't happen. Yeah. And wouldn't, you know, it just didn't happen. A cold case review was launched again in 2000 and concluded Jessie had been murdered and her remains were finally buried. But her killer remains at large and the case remains unsolved. The cliffs and the shrubland haven't changed much in the 32 years since Jessie's body was found here. But what has changed is science and technology. So could advancements in DNA profiling help to finally find her killer? Former detective Mark Williams Thomas helped the family to secure a new inquest. He's hopeful it could spark new lines of inquiry, even if crucial evidence like the bra have been destroyed. I firmly believe that had that bra been kept, and it would have been kept had the police ruled this a murder in 1989, the killer would have been caught. We are asking the coroner to allow us to exhume Jesse's body. And the reason for doing that is Jesse's DNA does not sit on the national database. And by putting it onto the national database, we potentially could link her to not just other offenders, but potentially items, trophies that have been kept by killers. As part of the inquest, serial killer Peter Tobin, who murdered three young women, could be called to give evidence. The family also want to see David Fuller investigated too, the man responsible for the bedsit murders in 1987. Both of them were living nearby when Jesse went missing. Kent police say at this stage there is no evidence to connect Fuller yes. to any other murder victims, but their investigation remains ongoing. The lawyer representing Sussex police at the hearing admitted the 1989 investigation was flawed. The case remains open, but with no active lines of inquiry. What are your hopes for the inquest? What do you hope? Just the truth. Well, I hope I get my yeah. bit of paper, her death certificate, <laughs> with a different yes. result on it. I mean, that's ultimately what I would like to hold in my hand. That's from day one, you that's said that. That's from day then. one, but I mean, um, well, they better hurry up. <laughs> we'll be too late for us. We've been saying this for the last 10 years, at least, with anything about the investigation. Well, we'll never know. We'll never know. But, I mean, there's a chance now we might. John and Val Earl there speaking to our reporter, Joe Caution. New statistics confirmed last year saw record numbers of people crossing the English Channel in small boats. More than 28,300 made the journey, travelling on more than 40% of days in 2021. That's triple the number for 2020. 
and the Home Office has confirmed migrants will be triaged at Lyd Airport before they are further processed in Dover. Those seeking entry to the UK will be given clothes, drinks and medical attention before being taken to Dover for further processing. A witness appeal has been issued by police investigating reports of a rape in a graveyard near Maidstone. It was reported to have happened at Oakwood Cemetery in Barming on the afternoon of December the 28th. A man has been arrested and bailed pending further inquiries. In particular, police want to talk to a woman seen walking two dogs in the area. You're watching ITV News in the Meridian region. Coming up... Calls for more help and understanding for those suffering from an all-too-common health condition. And flying high, the seagulls. Could 2022 be their year? And you can find more on today's top stories in the region throughout the day on our website. Go to itv.com forward slash meridian. You can call us on 0808 1010 095. And remember, you can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Now, there are warnings mental health problems caused by sleep issues are on the rise, with new research showing 7 in 10 women in our region are struggling to get a good night's rest. Yeah, I can understand that, because disrupted sleep has become more common since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. And Catherine Walker has been finding out why it is so crucial to develop a healthy bedtime routine. 29-year-old Keisha is getting some much-needed fresh air. She's feeling tired and frustrated after yet another night without any sleep. I average probably about five hours most of the time and I've, it's always broken sleep and I'm waking up all the time and it really impacts my mental health so it makes me quite grumpy and frustrated. I get really easily agitated by things and upset about the littlest of things because you know when you're tired and you, you get really emotional, don't you, and you feel really down. Sadly, Keisha isn't alone. Experts say that trouble sleeping is often more common in women, leading to an increased risk of mental health problems. Research shows 7 in 10 women are now suffering from poor sleep, and 1 in 10 have a sleep disorder like insomnia. I think we need to take sleep more seriously as a way to, to look after and manage our mental health. There's an association between a poor night's sleep and low mood, um, an increase of sort of stress and anxiety the following day. We know that lack of sleep leads to low energy levels, um, which means, quite frankly, that we're just un unlikely to feel at our best. It's a concern shared by sleep expert Dr Narina Ramlakan. She says it's important to try and set boundaries at bedtime. Don't look at your phone before you go to bed. Ideally, reading a book relaxing, meditating, journaling, so that by the time you get into bed, you've prepared yourself, you've transitioned into a restful state, which will then help you to get into deeper, more restful states of sleep. Tips these shoppers in Haywards Heath are keen to try out. Turn the telly off, just listen to some music, turn the lights down low and chill, basically. It's life, I'm afraid, you know, things are speeding up, it's getting more of a rat race. There's more worries about with the pandemic and everything else, and that's how it is. I don't sleep very well, and I know you don't. No, I don't sleep very well. Um, what do you put that down to? Um, worrying about life at the moment, I guess, and all the stress that's going on. It's advice that Keisha is keen to follow too. She's getting in some exercise, hoping that tonight she can finally get some sleep. Catherine Walker, ITV News. Oh, I hope you do as well. Now, thousands of people are suffering with painful chronic urinary tract infections that can last for months or even years. That's according to doctors and campaigners. The infections often begin as an acute bout of cystitis, but in some cases can become deadly. Now there are calls for better treatment and diagnosis of the life-altering condition. Here's Amrit Birdie. Bethany Macbeth lives in Canterbury. She spent years of her life battling agonising pain as a result of urinary tract infections. My first experience was when I was 15. I had my first UTI. Um, I then kind of began to have reoccurring UTIs uh, over the years. These flares can come on so suddenly and they're the most excruciating pain that I've ever experienced that 
you know, I'm not able to go out socially anymore. I, I, I get too scared to go, to go out. You want to carry on, but you can't. UTIs happen when bacteria enters the urinary system and they can affect your bladder, urethra or kidneys. Joanne McKinley's chronic UTI was misdiagnosed and she was rushed to hospital with urosepsis after the infection in her bladder spread to her bloodstream. It's led to her setting up a charity and a Facebook group that now has over 11,000 members, all of whom are fellow sufferers. We are an organisation of patients that seem better informed than the doctors that are treating us, who are using outdated tests and treatment methods that have been discredited in randomised control trials. When a patient gets a first acute UTI, the, the treatment is failing people. They are giving three days antibiotics that is not enough to kill the bacteria, and it's missing 25 to 35% of patients. What are they going to do about that? Experts at the only specialist clinic dedicated to treating chronic UTIs in the UK say they are overwhelmed with the number of patients they see, some of whom are unable to sit down for their consultation because of the excruciating pain they're in. We have to really understand or accept that um, the tests that we've been using um, for 70 years, they're failing. I think the, the best way forward really is to... Um, go back to the, the basic principles of medicine, and that is to treat the patient based on the clinical history, the signs from the examination, and from our understanding of um, the disease process in urinary tract infection. And we know that works. The NHS say they follow clear guidance from the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence on the treatment of UTIs. And NHS organisations offer expert-led follow-up clinics to both men and women who need them. NHS staff are also provided with detailed information and training to ensure that they can provide the best possible treatment to patients. Campaigners like Joanna are determined to keep raising awareness of the painful condition that she says ruined two decades of her life. Amrit Birdie, ITV News. Now the ITV Evening News continues with the National and International News at 6 30. Let's go to London now. Mary Nightingale for more. I'll be bringing you the very latest on the spread of Omicron. The Prime Minister tries to lessen the threat to essential services by requiring some workers to take tests daily. Meanwhile, the pressure on the NHS mounts as hospitals declare critical incidents. Also tonight, the courtroom showdown between Prince Andrew and Virginia Giuffre's lawyers in New York. And the remarkable story of the twins born just 15 minutes apart, but who'll be celebrating birthdays in different years. Do join me for those stories and more at 6.30. We certainly will be joining you for that, Mary. Well, Pip has joined us now. And Pip 22 is upon us. And already we're talking about record-breaking weather. We really are. In fact, we had the double whammy for New Year's Eve and New Year's Day. Some record high temperatures, all thanks to some very mild air coming straight up from the Canary Islands of oh, all places. Lovely. <laughs> They're lovely indeed. Let's take a look at the actual figures that we had. So let's take a look at our first one. This is for New Year's Eve. Uh, the previous UK record maximum temperature stood at 14.8 Celsius. That was eclipsed on Friday. Friday with a high of 16.5. Now that was in Wales, but locally we recorded a balmy 14.1 Celsius at both Manston and East Malling. And that was then followed by another record breaker for New Year's Day. Let's have a look at that one. The previous UK record, 15.6, recorded way back in 1916. Uh, this year we saw an unprecedented 16.3 Celsius, Goodness. and even locally we broke the previous record, Frittenden coming in at 15.7, but sadly a distinct lack of sunshine. No. <laughs> Absolutely, I was going to ask you about that. Where is the sunshine? Yeah. Is it coming back soon? <laughs> well, you know, I can promise some sunshine. It's going to be a bit of a roller coaster weather wise over the next few days. Some spells of cloud and rain. But where we do see the sunshine, as many people will have probably noticed today, as the earlier cloud and rain cleared and the sunshine came out, the temperatures dropped yes, like a did. stone. It was really yeah. chilly when it I went was. out for my lunch. <laughs> well, that's what we're facing over the next few days. So we're getting the sunshine, but not the balmy temperatures. Oh. Proof that at this time of year, you cannot have. Have it all. No, you can't have your cake and eat it. We don't like that, do we? We want it. <laughs> yes, we, we want it now. <laughs> Let's find out exactly what's in store. Here's Pip. <laughs> Feels like home. Whatever the weather. Valent boilers and heat pumps. Sponsors ITV Meridian Weather.
all looking very changeable over the next few days then but where we do manage to see the best of any winter sunshine it will also be accompanied by some fairly chilly conditions as well so the air mass sequence over the next few days tells the story the oranges and yellows indicating some spells of milder weather interspersed with the blues and greens indicating colder air coming our way and we'll flip and flop between the two as we head through the rest of the week and into the weekend out there at the moment then the earlier cloud rain and a little sleet has now cleared away and underneath clearing skies it will be a chilly night all round temperatures in towns and cities probably just about the right side of freezing but rural spots dipping to minus two minus three locally giving rise to a patchy frost by dawn tomorrow morning then a chilly start plenty of winter sunshine first thing but a frost on the ground for some and then through the course of the day little in the way of change really the frost will melt but will hold on to that winter sunshine however it's not going to help the temperatures it will be a cold day all round highs of just five or six celsius add on the northwesterly breeze and feeling colder still quite a significant wind chill these are the high tides then for tomorrow for chatham four minutes past two in the morning around half two again in the afternoon now looking ahead to the latter stages of wednesday and overnight into thursday it will be another dry clear and frosty night all round but you'll notice that as we get going on thursday we'll start to see rain moving into western parts that will eventually track its way towards us pushing quite a bit of cloud ahead of it as well so as i said all very changeable over the coming days where we do see the best of any sunshine temperatures taking a bit of a dip saturday looking rather wet and windy but some recovery in temperatures then as a result valent sponsors itv meridian weather it's all over the place isn't it now in just a moment the itv evening news with mary nightingale for now though from the team here at itv meridian thank you very much for watching bye 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 bye